What are the different types of alignments? They are called, there are local alignments where you don't focus on the entire sequence. Now remember, we are talking about protein sequences, right? 300 amino acids long, 500 amino acids, 1200 amino acids long. So, you know, everything you've been looking at right now, just so you begin to appreciate and um, how this is done, is you're looking at scaled down versions where you can just kind of hand draw and hand identify what is similar, right? In real life, bro, these are really large sequences, IT, the information technology infrastructure has to get involved, programming has to be done, tools have to be developed uh, in order to understand this. So local alignments, one or more alignments describing the most similar regions, when sequences are really dissimilar, you can't just say, I'm just going to put gaps to make things that are really do not deserve to be uh, aligned, I'm going to make them aligned. So you say, but on the other hand, there might be regions within the sequences which require to be aligned, okay? And that is what is called a local alignment. A global alignment, on the other hand, is you just line them up end to end and put gaps in there and you say, I'm going to look at the entire sequence. I'm looking at the sequence in its entirety. But this works best when sequences are similar. And then you have a combination of global and local, and that's called a glocal alignment. That is, if you have sequences which kind of fit the bill of, you know, of that would work with global as well as local similarities. Okay, and there's a link here which will tell you a little bit about that. What are the alignment methods? Uh, there is what's called the dot matrix method and the dynamic programming method. So the dot matrix method and the dynamic programming method and the dynamic programming method, there is what is called the Needleman-Wunsch global alignment, which is good for global alignment and the Smith-Waterman, which is for local alignment. Now, again, we are going to look at very scaled down, scaled down versions of this, recognizing that this is what somebody would have to do by hand, but then somebody writes software associated with it, in which case you can do this for typical protein and DNA sequences. Okay, so let's look at dot matrix. So in a dot matrix sequence, you write one row at the top of the matrix, okay, and the other row at from the left to, uh, one is from left to right, one is the other one is from top to bottom. And the two sequences we're going to deal with is ATGCATT and ACTGATT. So you, you know, again, you could do this by hand, right? But that's not the point. And the other sequence, uh, so it's an M by N matrix, so it doesn't have to be a M by M matrix. It doesn't have to be a symmetrical matrix. You know, the number of rows can be different from the number of columns. Always remember, Rows written first, columns written second. So you can see this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns. In this case, it's an M by M matrix, but it doesn't have to be. So what you would typically do is you say you put a dot wherever you find a similarity. So you would put a dot here, A and A, nothing, 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 dot, nothing, nothing. And C, you would have nothing, 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 dot, nothing, nothing, nothing. And T would have a dot, nothing, and then two dots at the end. And this is what you would typically see. Okay. Now, if two sequences were exactly identical, A would match with A, C would match with C, T would match with T, you know, etc, etc. And so you look at what is the diagonal, how the diag the nature of the diagonal or how populated that diagonal is tells you how much these sequences are matching. In this case, you see they're not, right? Now, one of the disadvantages of a dot matrix system is you're not allowed to put in gaps, okay? So it is as is. Let's look at this sequence matched with a, another sequence. Now, you see that the dot matrix, you might say, well, it doesn't tell us much in terms of alignment. It gives us a qualitative view of it. But if you really think about what the sequence is, I've just reversed these two sequences, right? And they are put in the, exactly how you would do for a dot matrix. And notice at the, while there's not much similarity here, there's a little bit of similarity here. Look at the kind of the, the line that's orthogonal to the, or at 90 degrees to the, to the, to the diagonal. And you realize that is very populated. Now, if that is populated, you will realize that this sequence is just a reverse of the sequence because that's how that's how the alignment uh, will will take place. OK, and so there's a lot of qualitatively useful information you get. What happens when you put dot matrix in a real life situation? Again, this entire sequence is written here. This entire sequence is written here. 
And again, you get a lot of qualitative information, reverse, repeats, etc. And we look at look a little bit more about this in the next slide. It cannot be used for alignment. There's no insertions, there's no gaps, etc. You can see it's very noisy, right? There's not much you can say from this dot matrix. You know, the diagonal is, you know, it, it gives you a sense that the diagonal, that is not, these sequences are not aligned because, you know, the diagonals are relatively empty. But then there's large sequence of repeats, you know, of, of great similarity. Um, and again, you can't really say much in terms of, of this additional, of all this additional information. So you can see it's a bit of a mess, right? Let's look at an example of a dot matrix. Now this is again, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. It's, this is aligned with this. So you can see that the same sequence because the diagonal terms are the same, but you'll begin to see other patterns too. You, and you can also see, well, the off diagonal terms are not the same, okay? But there's other little interesting patterns which arise. And because you have occupancies like this in, term, in this matrix, you'll realize that it's just A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, okay? So yeah, it's the same sequence, so the diagonal terms are the same, but because you get patterns like this, you realize it's just a repeat re regions that are just continually repeating. Let's look at another example. A, B, C, D, A, B, right? M and O, that, and this, and it is, they're the same sequence because the diagonal is fully populated, this right, fully occupied. Every term matches every every other term. But you'll get some other information. So, for example, you'll realize that here's a little a, a sequence of lines which tells you something really nice. And that is that, yes, A, B, C, D, E, there is a reverse. The next part of the sequence is really a reverse of the first part. And you might, in a long sequence, you might not begin to understand this, but there are, there are these definite patterns which begin to arise, which tells you a little more about the sequence. Let's look at dynamic programming. And remember, in dynamic programming, we are going to look, programming, we're going to look at two. One is the Needleman Bunch, which is good for global alignment, and the other is the Smith Waterman, which is good for local alignment. And what is dynamic programming? It's a simple, you know, straightforward definition. We're never going to begin to understand this in terms of what is dynamic program is you take a big problem and you make it into smaller problems. Okay, you, you convert it into smaller solvable problems. So remember, we are looking now at the Needleman Wunsch algorithm, which is used for global alignment. And this is the this is an algorithm which is used to match sequences. Now we always for the purposes of this module, we are always scaling down. And we are scaling down because you can do by hand and you get a true appreciation for what how this algorithm would go into a program. And then you would be able to do sequences of any length. And there's, you know, the NCBI has a website which allows you to put two sequences in two different boxes and say match them using the Needleman Bunch algorithm. And uh, that is used for what is called a global alignment. Now we are dealing with a recurrence relationship, okay? which means that a, it's, it's, it's a calculation that, that a previous term feeds into itself, and that, that, that's, what, that's what allows us to create the new term. And then this new term feeds into the equation again, and that's what, that's what creates the next term and the next term and the next term. And so basically what this calculation allows is, allows terms to recur. So what are the criteria for the recursion? So let's say just like in the dot matrix, we are creating a matrix. And in this matrix, we have, let's say, the i col row and the j column. Remember, by convention, the row is always mentioned first, the column is always mentioned second. So the tij term is, you do these calculations, three calculations, and the one for which this is the maximum, that is identified as uh, that is identified as the TI term, and that's the matrix you put. And you design the create the matrix just like you would if you were um, like it, like you would create the dot matrix. You you put one uh, one sequence from left to right on top, and then the other one from top to bottom. So complete the matrix using the above recurrence relationship. And let's use this for two simple examples, which if you look closely, doesn't seem to be a lot of match. Okay, it doesn't seem something that you would match, but let's see how the program works. Now, the term sigma here is, is a term used if the two terms match, the two terms that you're matching in the sequence, sequence terms match, okay, S for sequence. 
if there is a mismatch it's negative 1 and let's say we include a gap penalty of negative 1. Now just say it's to negative 1 we don't let's not worry about whether it was determined using an affine penalty or a um, or a constant penalty or a linear penalty. So TGGT we're going to write this on from left to right and ATCG we're going to write this from right to left okay and what you see here so TGGT and what I'm trying to show you here is so this will be row 0 row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4, and column 0, column 1, column 2, column 3, column 4. four. Now, the idea is to use the recurrence relationship in order to populate this term. So, let's give it a seed value where the 0, 0th term is 0. Okay, let's just call that term 0. Now, let's look at some of the calculations, right? So, now we're looking to populate the 0 first, the 0, 1 element term. And the 0, 1 element would be a maximum of these three particular calculations. And so remember, look, uh, you can keep your formula at the back of your mind. So it's negative 1 and 0. And obviously, negative 1, the term doesn't exist. Um, the next is negative 1 and 1, because that's ti minus 1, j plus g. And i minus 1, which is 0 minus 1, is negative 1. This doesn't exist either. And for, for the term 0 and 1, i and j minus 1 is 0, 0, plus the gap penalty, which is negative 1. So the score there is negative 1. Okay, so I'll help you with these calculations for a few terms, and then you'll see how that's calculated, and then you can populate the rest. And I recommend that, you know, if this slide doesn't really help you but gives you some idea, look at it again, try to do the calculations by hand, and that'll really help you, okay? Now let's look at the next calculation. Now we're looking for the 0 2th term, which is row 0, column 2. And so I have i minus 1, j minus 1, that's negative 1 and 1. And again, negative 1 doesn't exist, negative 1 doesn't exist, so we don't even include these. And then I have, you know, i and j minus 1, that's 0, 1. But we know 0, 1 is negative 1. So negative 1, negative 1 is negative 2. Now, similarly, you will be able to look at these calculations. Again, the negative 1 term, which still shows up in the equation, we're going to ignore. So I kind of, you know, made this, to let this go a little quickly. So you have terms negative 3 and negative 4. Now, let's look at the columns, okay? In the column, we're trying to populate the row 1, column 0, okay? So that's 1 and 0 and 1, negative 1, so that doesn't exist. And 2 and negative 1, which is... This is, this is not necessarily correct. This should be 1 and negative 1, but negative 1 doesn't exist, so it doesn't affect us. And the little mistake that I made. And t0, 0, which is g0 and negative 1. And this term is, therefore, negative 1. And so you're populating this with negative 1. You can do the same calculation again. Uh, and that's negative 2. And then negative 3 and negative 4. Now let's look at row 1, column 1 the t1 and 1 term, okay? If you look at the t1 and 1 term, you'll get negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, 0, 1. Now, here the term becomes 0, and again, you can do this calculation by hand, which I certainly recommend. The term becomes 0 because there is a match. So that sigma term in the first equation, which gets, gets the highest score, actually has a 0. So this is the first time we see a 0, that's negative 1, negative 2, and negative 2. And then there is a negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and negative 2, 0, 0, and negative 1. Now, how do we, how do we actually determine how we can do the matching? Okay, so you always look at the bottom right-hand side, and the largest number you see on the bottom right-hand side, and that's 0. Not negative 1, it's 0. So you start from here. Okay, so now when you start from here, you know that this g and g, because it's a high number, you'll actually find a match. Now you can remember the point about these recurrent relationships is you can go in every direction, any direction that you want, but you want to go in the direction where you see the highest numbers. So z instead of going from 0 to negative 2, 0 to negative 1, you go to 0 to 0. But that doesn't help you because you already have a match with the G and the G. Alternatively, you could have a match with this G and this G, okay? And then the next th the term that you can go is you can go here or you can go to this negative one. 
and then you go to this zero and then you go to this a now so what are the real matches you see you see the match between t and t you see a match between g and g the best case is if you have a negative one here so you're likely going to match the c with the g and have a mismatch but then you're going to go to the next highest number which is zero and that works nicely because you can match the t and the t okay so this is the example we started out with and here's the matching that we have so you have two matches which makes a lot of sense because those were the high numbers in our matrix there are gaps on either side because you know this is not an easy match even if you visually look at it and and you see the matches here okay now i'd like you to go and look at the needleman bunch algorithm because there is a superb uh, slideshow here that I would certainly recommend you look at. Okay, go to this website. It explains it in great detail. It certainly does uh, this topic a lot more justice than I have done in three slides in doing this. Now let's go to the Smith-Waterman algorithm. And uh, the Smith-Waterman is associated with local alignment. Same deal, it's a relation, recurring relationship. Uh, that's how you complete each cell of the matrix. The I and J at the term of the matrix is a maximum of uh, of these four calculations. Now, three of the calculations are exactly like needleman Wunsch. But what Smith-Waterman does is it ignores the need for negative numbers. And so it says, well, or zero. So if you have a negative number, you're going to put, you're not going to put the negative number because if the best you can do is negative from these three criterion, you just say, well, zero. And zero is the maximum, so you put a lot of zeros. And so here is an example of a of the same sequence, your TGGT, ATCG. You're going to get a lot of zeros. So all of these would have typically been negative. Now you might say, well, where do you get the positive numbers from? Well, because remember, that the recurrence relationship is associated with a previous number. And the reason why you get positive numbers here is because you have zeros. The previous number is a zero, not a negative number. So it doesn't influence this. And here what we actually tried was something slightly different. So we have plus one for a match, negative one for a mismatch, and a negative two for a gap. Okay, again, the recurrence relationship is zero. And because some of the terms are zero, the negativity goes away and you get terms like this. Now, if you were to build this up, you would go this way, same thing, there and there. So what you see is you would go, uh, there's one arrow missing here, but it doesn't matter because we're not really doing an alignment. So the G aligns with the G, the C aligns with this G, and the T aligns with the T. Same thing in Needleman, Wunsch, and Smith-Waterman. Now again, that doesn't mean they are the same. It means one is good for local alignment and one is good for, for, um, one is good for global alignment and one is good for local alignment. This is a mistake. It really should be local alignment.